Okay, we're about to embark on a complete tour of our solar system. But before we set off, I have a question for you. How do you want to travel? I ask because if we were to simulate a real-time journey aboard a spacecraft, well, I'm afraid it would take us more than 50 years to chase all eight planets as they orbit with the risk of reaching Pluto when we're already in our 80s, or worse. So, let's settle for using our trusty and incredibly fast steed of imagination and begin our exploration from the center of it all, the Sun. And there it is, our Sun. It's the closest star to Earth, the engine behind all terrestrial weather. It influences the climate enables the seasons, facilitates photosynthesis, forms the basis of every ecosystem, and bestows upon us light, warmth, and energy. At this very moment, we have it right before our eyes, at a mere distance of no more than 10 million kilometers. Getting any closer wouldn't be advisable. Peeking through the portholes, the fiery sphere appears as large as a clenched fist held at arm's length. Since there's no atmosphere to scatter or filter its light, in space, the Sun appears much brighter and more intense compared to an observed from Earth's surface. And it's not yellow, but white. Furthermore, contrary to what one might think, certain features that can only be observed from Earth during eclipses or with the help of a chronograph, such as prominences and the corona, are equally visible from space. The reason lies in the fact that the photosphere, its surface, is too luminous and even here in space, it dazzles us, preventing us from seeing the fainter structures. Even to catch a glimpse of sunspots, we need special filters. Nevertheless, the spectacle is still impressive, especially considering the backdrop of the immense atomic furnace set against a pitch dark sky filled with stars. Before we embark on further destinations, let's look at some numbers. Composed of approximately 75% hydrogen by mass, the Sun is classified as a yellow dwarf star, and its mass is so immense that it accounts for 99% of the entire solar system's mass. The Sun is one of about 300 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. It's a fairly average star, neither too large nor too small, neither too cold nor too hot. Its surface temperature is about 5,500 degrees Celsius, enough to melt any known natural or artificial material. It has a diameter of almost 1,400,000 kilometers, which is approximately 109 times the Earth's diameter. Its mass is 2,000 quadrillion metric tons, about 330,000 times the mass of our planet. It is located at an average distance of 149,600,000 kilometers from Earth, a distance that takes light 8 minutes and 19 seconds to travel known as an Astronomical Unit, or AU. It's also worth mentioning that the Sun doesn't rotate as a rigid structure. The polar regions complete one rotation in 35 days, while the equatorial regions take just 25 days. The differential rotation distorts the lines of force of the magnetic field and gives rise to the phenomena of sunspots. These are darker regions that appear on the surface of the star and can be larger than 50,000 kilometers in diameter. The sunspots follow a regular cycle of approximately 11 years, during which they increase in number and then decrease, marking periods of greater and lesser solar activity. These phases have an impact on us, causing fluctuations in Earth's global temperature. On the other hand, solar prominences and flares can trigger electromagnetic storms on our planet. The energy and particles emitted during these explosions are carried by the solar wind, a constant stream of material expelled from the Sun's corona to Earth, where they interact with air molecules causing polar auroras and can even disrupt telecommunications by interfering with signal transmission. Okay, but all of this doesn't explain where all the energy and heat released by this colossal mass of matter come from. The explanation is rather simple. In order to be classified as a star, a celestial body must undergo thermonuclear fusion reactions in its core. These reactions occur when two atomic nuclei have enough energy to collide and merge into a larger nucleus. In the case of the Sun, for example, four hydrogen nuclei are involved in a series of reactions that ultimately result in a helium nucleus. In the Sun's core, every second 600 million tons of hydrogen nuclei 
fuse to form 596 million tons of helium nuclei. Where do the missing 4 million tons go? They are transformed into energy thanks to the most famous equation in physics, E equals mc squared. Every second the sun produces an amount of energy equivalent to that of 6,000 billion Hiroshima bombs. But of course, the influence of the sun is not limited to energy emission. Our star is first and foremost the gravitational engine of the solar system, the mass that holds together all the matter that evolved from a large cloud of hydrogen and dust 4.5 billion years ago. All the planets in the solar system, and in some cases even comets, asteroids and meteorites, orbit elliptically around the sun, which in turn revolves around the center of our galaxy at an approximate speed of 250 kilometers per second. Okay, but now we want to move on quickly. From here, the view of this behemoth is enchanting, but there's always the unsettling feeling of being reached and vaporized by some deadly protrusion. It's better to complete the journey and head back outward. While the Sun is undoubtedly the most inhospitable place in the solar system, the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, are not exactly the places you want to spend your summer vacation. Mercury is the first planet we encounter after leaving the Sun. Let's fly over it at a distance of 300 kilometers from the surface, and as we get closer, we have the impression of observing a fireball split in half, blazingly bright on the side facing the Sun and pitch dark on the other. Only when the apparent size of the planet starts to increase and the contrast of sunlight decreases can we see that the planet presents a rather dim and uniform appearance, a grayish ball like the moon, but without the contrasting shades of the lunar seas that characterize our satellite in the hemisphere facing the Earth. The surface, however, is dotted with countless craters, the largest of which is Caloris Planitia, the heat plane with a diameter of 1,600 kilometers, surrounded by a series of concentric mountain chains, likely generated by the same impact that formed the basin 3.9 billion years ago. Mercury is the planet closest to the Sun with an average distance of just under 58 million kilometers, 3.2 light minutes, with a diameter approximately one-third that of the Earth, measuring 4,878 kilometers, it is the smallest of the planets, even smaller than the moons Ganymede and Titan. It completes its orbit, the most elliptical among the planets in the solar system, in a mere 88 Earth days, while it rotates very slowly on its axis, taking about 59 Earth days to complete one rotation. The ratio between these two numbers is exactly 3 to 2, meaning the planet rotates on its axis three times for every two orbits around the Sun. Mercury is also the second densest planet after Earth. It possesses a large iron and silicon core that accounts for 85% of the planet's diameter. Similar to our moon, it is virtually devoid of an atmosphere, blown away by the strong solar wind. As a result, the regions near the equator reach temperatures of 430 degrees Celsius during the day, dropping below minus 185 degrees Celsius at night. This extreme temperature fluctuation, the largest in the solar system, is due to the lack of an atmosphere that would play a role in heat redistribution. The only areas on Mercury that experience a relatively constant temperature are the polar regions, which tend to stay around minus 90 degrees Celsius due to the planet's small axial tilt. In short, Mercury seems to be the planet of records. The only problem for us is that these records are all aimed at eliminating us as quickly as possible if we were to set foot on its surface. So let's keep our distance, and instead, let's try heading towards Venus, the planet of love, beauty, and so on. Will we have better luck? We're sorry to disappoint you even before we arrive. It's true that Venus, being the brightest planet in Earth's sky, has been associated with beauty since ancient times. It's also true that in terms of mass and size, it can be considered a twin of Earth. However, its arid surface and corrosive atmosphere, a thick blanket of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid clouds, make it an entirely inhospitable environment, which even space probes struggle to reach. This beauty orbits at a distance of 108 million kilometers from the Sun, six minutes in terms of light travel time. On the surface, the temperature soars close to 500 degrees Celsius, enough to fry any spacecraft, and the atmospheric pressure is 92 times higher than that of Earth, akin to being a kilometer underwater. In other words, Martian rovers on Venus would be destroyed. 
The fact that, in other respects, Venus is so similar to Earth makes it very intriguing and suggests that perhaps in the distant past, it could have had a climate similar to ours. And we are looking at it right now, this beautiful yet unfortunate world, as we orbit less than a thousand kilometers above its surface. A surface completely unobservable to the naked eye, but one that we know perfectly well thanks to past radar surveys conducted by the Magellan spacecraft, which revealed craters, mountains, and vast volcanic plains. Venus lacks water. It is believed that the planet once had seas and oceans like Earth, but its extremely high temperature due to the harsh greenhouse effect caused the water to evaporate, leaving behind a dry and rocky surface. The majority of its expanse is occupied by desert plains formed by lava flows, so much so that the Magellan probe detected traces of lava rivers stretching over 6,000 kilometers. The planet is home to at least 156 large shield volcanoes, which span over 100 kilometers, in addition to numerous smaller volcanoes. The rotation of the planet is very slow, taking 243 Earth days to complete one Venusian day, while its orbital period is 224.7 days. On Venus, a day is longer than a year. Furthermore, its motion is retrograde from east to west, contrary to the direction of motion of Earth and nearly all other planets in the solar system. Paradoxically, there exists a place on Venus where conditions could be somewhat favorable for the survival of human beings. It is located in the atmosphere at an altitude of nearly 50 kilometers above the planet's surface. The pressure there can be compared to that on Earth, and the temperature varies within a fairly comfortable range from 0 to 50 degrees Celsius. Already there is a talk of airships, aerostatic spacecraft, but in any case these are things that belong to a far distant future of exploration. As we leave the dense clouds of Venus behind, a truly extraordinary sight begins to come into view on the forward screens, a radiant blue sphere mottled with white of unimaginable beauty, accompanied by a large rocky moon. A delicate veil of thin white clouds envelops those patches of color that we know to be oceans and continents. And we know this because, of course, that world is our home. Observing it from such a distance cannot help but make you contemplate the fragility of that thin bubble of air surrounding it, making life possible in the vacuum of space. A film one thousandth the diameter of Earth. Insignificance. Yet, it is this insignificance that makes all the difference between life and death. But how did this oasis amidst nothingness so teeming with life come to be? By chance. Our Earth owes all its fortune, unique among all the planets, to the fact that it has trillions of cubic meters of water freely flowing on its surface. And this is due to its orbiting at just the right distance from the Sun right in the heart of that famous habitable zone that guarantees the existence of water in the form of ice, vapor, and liquid. From a distance of 400 kilometers, where we find ourselves at this very moment, we can only speculate about the presence of intelligent life if we look at the nighttime hemisphere, scattered with clusters of light. On the daylight side, we see clouds, cyclones, patches of yellowish deserts, Australia lost in the Pacific, and further below the mysterious continent of ice Antarctica. This Eden quickly fades away as we leave it behind, with our spacecraft now setting its sights directly on the Moon. The Moon is the only natural satellite of our planet, and it's more than enough. In fact, it is quite large compared to its parent planet, with a diameter of 3,450 kilometers, over a quarter the diameter of Earth. This has led some astronomers to consider the Earth-Moon system as a double planet. However, since the center of mass around which both bodies orbit lies beneath the surface of the Earth, the Earth-Moon system is officially labeled as a planet-satellite system. The Moon plays a vital role for us. Its gravity helps to maintain Earth stable on its axis. Without it, Earth's axis would oscillate wildly, making the existence of life difficult. The Moon is also responsible for our ocean tides which, thanks to the famous tidal pools, considered by paleontologists as actual biological incubators, could have favored the emergence of life. And we are neglecting many other things, such as the asteroid bombardment suffered 3.9 billion years ago, the heavy cratering of the surface, and the peculiar phenomena of the lunar seas, the dark lava plains that enrich the moon only in the hemisphere facing the Earth. 
What makes the moon so scientifically interesting is that, unlike Earth, it is a simple place. It lacks the protective atmosphere that Earth has, with no winds or rains, and its surface is not reshaped by tectonic activity. Therefore, the moon still preserves evidence of its origin from Earth, as well as traces of its geological history. We will return there. Within a couple of years, we will establish bases. So let's continue our virtual journey to lesser-known places. As our journey continues, the apparent diameter of the sun keeps diminishing and its light grows fainter. Nevertheless, there is still enough to make that reddish pinpoint of light shine brighter and larger in front of us. It's Mars, the fourth planet from the sun, the ultimate alien world, the scientific dream of generations of astronomers and enthusiasts alike, an icon forever ingrained in everyone's imagination. It is the second smallest planet in the solar system, with a diameter just over half that of Earth and barely double that of the Moon. The distance from the Sun is quite variable as the planet moves along a rather eccentric orbit, but the average is 228 million kilometers, equivalent to 12.7 light minutes. Now we are approaching within 200 kilometers of the surface, and the sight of a world remarkably similar to ours becomes dominant, with mountains, canyons, winding dried riverbeds, vast plains, plateaus. The only difference is the absence of water. It hasn't rained on Mars for billions of years, and the average temperature is lower than on Earth. The temperature variation between day and night is significant. During the summer, the surface temperature in the equatorial regions reaches 25 degrees Celsius, while at night it rapidly drops to about minus 70 degrees Celsius. Mars is surrounded by a tenuous atmosphere composed mostly of carbon dioxide, and the surface pressure is about 1 150th of Earth's atmosphere. Despite the thin atmosphere, winds can reach high speeds on the planet due to its low gravity, only 38% of Earth's, lifting dust clouds that give rise to actual sandstorms. Today it appears as a cold, red desert, but it is believed that around 4 billion years ago it was warm and humid with a thicker atmosphere and covered by lakes, rivers, and seas. It is thought to have potentially supported life. However, with relative certainty, we can now say that Mars does not harbor any form of higher life. And unfortunately, the numerous probes sent there have not even managed to find traces of microbial life. And this could be the effect of the intense ultraviolet radiation to which the planet is exposed, deprived for a long time of an atmosphere that its small mass couldn't retain, and the absence of a magnetic field to shield it from the solar wind. The red color? Well, being much smaller than Earth after its formation, Mars cooled down much more rapidly. The iron minerals didn't have enough time to sink into the planet's core, but remained on the surface in higher proportions than on Earth. Over time, in contact with oxygen, the iron oxidized. It rusted, essentially giving the planet its most distinctive characteristic. There's also much to be said about its two small moons, Phobos and Deimos, but for now we can't spot them, perhaps obscured by the planet. So off we go, embarking on a rather long and challenging journey to reach Jupiter. Long because there is a distance of 550 million kilometers between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, which almost doubles when considering that it's difficult to travel in a straight line in a gravitational field like that of the solar system and challenging because we'll have to cross the asteroid belt. But anyway, the power of imagination, here we are already at the doorstep of this gigantic world. Jupiter, the fifth planet in distance from the Sun, is certainly the giant of the solar system, so big that it could fit Earth inside it 1300 times. Jupiter's mass is also remarkable, being 318 times that of Earth and 1,000th that of the Sun. The planet, at an average distance of 780 million kilometers from the Sun, which is about 43 light minutes, completes a full orbit around the Sun in nearly 12 Earth years. But it only takes 10 hours to complete one rotation on itself. This accounts for its noticeable polar flattening. But there's hardly any time to delve into more numbers. It will be a quick flyby, and therefore, we can only observe this immense mass of gas for a relatively short period from a height of 20,000 kilometers above its outer cloud layer. Jupiter is now passing beneath us, and it's a true symphony of colors. 
Its thick and turbulent atmosphere offers us an incredible chromatic spectacle. The clouds that envelop it display shades of ranging from red to yellow with subtle nuances of white and blue. This palette of colors extends for kilometers into Jupiter's atmosphere, creating a stunning visual effect. At first glance, the most prominent feature of the planet is undoubtedly the parallel bands that encircle it at various latitudes, bands of different widths and colors. In reality, like all gas giants, Jupiter doesn't have a solid surface, but rather the gaseous material becomes denser towards the planet's interior. What we see, therefore, is not the physical surface but the upper part of its atmosphere. The colored bands are systems of clouds driven by strong winds parallel to the planet's equator, with speeds exceeding 600 kilometers per hour. The surprising thing is that the winds blow in opposite directions in adjacent bands. The different colors of the bands indicate the presence of different chemical compounds and perhaps different chemical reactions. The most important compounds of the clouds are frozen ammonia and ammonium hydrosulfide crystals. The colors also vary from reddish to blue with the height of the clouds. The appearance of the cloud bands changes on time scales of hours or days. In addition to the bands, we can see protrusions, vortices, and irregular spots, the largest of which is the Great Red Spot, which is nothing but a massive atmospheric vortex elliptical in shape and variable in size, currently spanning 15,000 kilometers, but decades ago it was more than twice as large. It is located in the planet's southern hemisphere and was discovered by Italian astronomer Cassini in 1665. Its color ranges from almost brick red to pale salmon or even white. Other similar smaller vortices can be found along other cloud bands. In addition to its majestic atmosphere, Jupiter is surrounded by a wide range of fascinating moons. The largest of them all is Ganymede, which is bigger than Mercury and even has its own magnetic field. Other moons like Io, Europa, and Callisto offer unique landscapes and stimulate our imagination regarding what they might conceal. For instance, Io is speckled with active volcanoes that erupt periodically, creating splendid volcanic phenomena while Europa, beneath a thick crust that can be several kilometers deep, hides an ocean of liquid water whose composition and temperature are compatible with life. But these are just the largest ones. In reality, there are currently 91 other considerable smaller moons orbiting Jupiter, and their number keeps growing with the progress of the instruments used to discover new ones. Speaking of moons, if you think Jupiter has a lot of them, well, we're about to visit a planet that has as many as 146 moons, both large and small. We're talking about Saturn, of course. This leg of the journey from Jupiter to Saturn will be the longest so far, but there will be even longer ones later on, so let's go. But first, some information about the planet we're about to reach. Saturn, with an equatorial diameter of 120,000 kilometers, is the second largest planet after Jupiter to which it bears many similarities. It orbits the Sun at a distance of 1.43 billion kilometers, which is equal to 80 light minutes, completing one revolution in 29.5 years. Like Jupiter, Saturn also rotates rapidly on its axis, taking 10 hours and 39 minutes. Saturn is also a gas giant, and it's the lightest of them all. Its density is just 0.7 grams per cubic centimeter, even lower than that of water. The atmosphere is mainly composed of hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water vapor. Strong winds blow, reaching speeds of up to 1,800 kilometers per hour. Below the atmosphere, there is a deep layer of liquid hydrogen similar to Jupiter and a small solid core at the center. That's the portrait of the planet we're about to reach. The sky around us is as black as pitch, and the stars appear brighter than ever. Jupiter behind us is becoming smaller and smaller, while in front of us, it is slowly being replaced by a growing Saturn. To avoid any dangers while crossing the rings, we have chosen to fly over the planet's North Pole, about 2,000 kilometers above the surface. Surface? Well, we use this term loosely, but let's try to understand. Gas giants are primarily composed of gas rather than solid elements, so it can be difficult to determine where their atmosphere ends and their surface begins. 
However, the surface is defined as the layer with atmospheric pressure equal to sea level on Earth. Flying over the pole gives us a unique opportunity to appreciate the incredible spectacle of the famous hexagon, a very strange atmospheric structure that may have formed due to jet streams in the upper layers of Saturn's atmosphere. The strange thing is that the hexagon, approximately 30,000 kilometers wide, has no counterpart at the planet's south pole or around the poles of the other three gas giants in the outer solar system. Astronomers have known about it for decades, but it's not excluded that it may have originated centuries ago. The swift flyby also allows us to notice that Saturn's surface features are much less pronounced compared to those of Jupiter. The globe has a rather uniform yellowish color, while the cloud structures and equatorial bands, although present, appear significantly faded. Although not resplendent with colors, the spectacle is still assured by the incredible view of the shadow of the inner rings cast onto the planet, creating geometries of unbearable beauty. Ah, the rings. We hadn't forgotten about them. Since we couldn't find the words to describe them, we simply left them for last, hoping to be eventually rescued by the pen of Victor Hugo or Carl Sagan. Unfortunately, the miracle doesn't happen, so we'll limit ourselves to a brief description and a few numbers. First of all, it should be noted that all gas giants in the solar system have their own ring systems, but Saturn's is the most extensive, dense, and conspicuous. The rings of Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune are so faint that they are not visible to the naked eye, neither from Earth nor from space. The rings are not solid, but are composed of countless small particles ranging in size from micrometers to meters orbiting around Saturn. The ring particles are mainly made of water ice, with traces of rocky material. There is still no consensus on their formation mechanism. It was once believed that the rings formed along with the planet, but the latest data suggests a much more recent birth, even within the past 100 million years, likely due to the tidal disruption of one of the planet's moons. The main rings extend from 7,000 to 80,000 kilometers from Saturn's equator, with a total thickness estimated at just a few tens of meters, and apparently their mass would be two-thirds of the mass of the entire Antarctic ice cap on Earth. Now think about all the incredible interactions that could occur between the rings and most of Saturn's 166 moons. There's something for everyone, starting with those that carry the so-called Shepard satellites which control the confinement of particles within each individual ring. But as we're discussing them, Saturn is slipping away behind us, and there's only time left to talk about Titan, a moon so large, 5,150 kilometers in diameter, that it competes for the title of the largest moon in the solar system with Ganymede. Titan is a bit like Venus. It hides its surface beneath a thick layer of clouds and haze. But with radar and direct exploration, we now know enough about Titan to christen it as the world most similar to the primordial Earth, except for the temperature, which is decidedly far from our survival standards. Whether life has evolved or will ever evolve on Titan is still a subject of scientific debate. But one thing is more certain, the conditions on this moon of Saturn are destined to change. In less than a billion years, the Sun will start to expand, becoming a red giant star and increasing in size to the point where life on Earth may become impossible. There is hope for us, though, because at that point, Titan could increase its temperature and offer an alternative location for the evacuation of humanity. Who knows? One thing is certain. If we were to ever establish a human outpost on Titan or any of Saturn's moons, its inhabitants would have an incredible view. Looking up at night and even during the day and seeing Saturn with its ring system crossing the sky would leave most people literally astounded. Anyway, farewell to Saturn and its countless wonders, too many to be described in their entirety. Our next destination is Uranus, a gas giant that orbits 1.5 billion kilometers further. Uranus is perhaps the strangest planet in the solar system. At some point in its history, it must have experienced an impact that significantly tilted its axis of rotation. There are over a dozen rings surrounding this world, and it has 27 moons orbiting around it. We don't know how or when the planet tilted, nor how such a tilted planet manages to maintain such an orderly system of moons. The planet's atmosphere is a mixture of hydrogen, helium, and heavier compounds, 
that exist as ice in the depths of Uranian clouds. But apart from a few curious pieces of information, scientists actually know very little about this Cerulean world, which was visited for the first and only time by the Voyager 2 spacecraft in 1986. But this could soon change. Together with Neptune, Uranus could be in fact the representative of the most common type of exoplanet in the galaxy. Scientists believe that unraveling the mysteries of Uranus, such as its strange magnetic field, its internally structured cloud-wrapped interior, and its extraordinarily low temperatures, could be the key to understanding the origin and role of thousands of extrasolar planets, many of which are roughly the same size as this ice giant we are currently flying over with our imaginary spacecraft. But let's proceed in order. On average, Uranus is located 2.87 billion kilometers from the Sun a distance that light covers in 160 minutes, and it completes its orbit around the Sun in 84 years. Uranus has an average diameter of 51,100 kilometers, exactly four times that of Earth, making it the third largest planet in the solar system. Like all the other gas giants, it is surrounded by a ring system, although very dark and unobservable to the naked eye. From space, Uranus appears with a celestial blue color, the methane molecules present in the upper atmosphere absorb the red component of light and reflect the blue, giving the planet its characteristic hue. The average surface temperature of Uranus is very low, below minus 200 degrees Celsius, and it does not undergo appreciable variations from one season to another. Uranus's atmosphere is composed of 83% hydrogen, 15% helium, and 2% methane, with traces of other hydrocarbons. Like Jupiter and Saturn, there are also clouds on Uranus, probably formed by methane crystals driven by high-speed winds. However, these cloud systems are very faint and not very visible. One proposed exploration for this scarcity of features is that Uranus's internal heat is significantly lower than that of the other gas giant planets. And it's no wonder that Uranus is the coldest planet in the solar system. However, the southern hemisphere does show some large-scale features such as a bright polar cap at the South Pole and thin dark bands surrounding the equator. Between the polar cap and the dark equatorial band, a very bright band is clearly visible. It is the planet's brightest feature and has been nicknamed the Collar. It is now believed that the Collar and the Cap are dense regions of methane clouds located about 30 kilometers below the observable surface. The two largest of the five major moons, Titania and Oberon, both have diameters exceeding 1,500 kilometers. The orbits of the regular moons are nearly coplanar with Uranus's equator, while the irregular moons have elliptical and highly inclined orbits and are located at great distances from the planet. And with that, Uranus also begins to release its hold on us. The eagerness to reach the farthest planet in the solar system and then return home grows stronger within us. And once again, we have to cross an abyss of 1.63 billion kilometers. Such is the distance that separates Uranus's orbit from that of Neptune. Neptune orbits the Sun at an average distance of 4.5 billion kilometers, equivalent to 278 light minutes, and takes 164 years to complete one orbit. It is slightly smaller than Uranus, measuring 49,500 kilometers in diameter, but it is more massive than Uranus. It rotates on its axis in just over 16 hours, around an axis that is tilted 28 degrees to the plane of the ecliptic. Remembering that the tilt of the Earth's axis is 23.5 degrees, it follows that Neptune has seasons very similar to those on Earth, although each lasts for 41 years. Neptune's atmosphere is composed almost entirely of hydrogen and helium with traces of methane, which explains its intense blue color due to methane's property of absorbing red light and allowing only blue light to pass through. Neptune resembles Uranus so much that it is often said that the solar system has two pairs of twin planets, Venus Earth in the inner planets and Uranus Neptune in the outer planets. Even Neptune's surface appears rather uniform. Amidst the blue, only a few whitish streaks of clouds stand out. But as we approach closer, we can also see a large dark spot in the southern hemisphere, believed to be like Jupiter's great red spot, an elliptical-shaped anticyclone extending for 13,000 kilometers. Currently, it is believed to be more of a structure similar to Earth's ozone hole, 
a thinning of the surface clouds that allows observations of the underlying atmospheric layers. This is where the most powerful winds in the entire solar system have been recorded, with speeds reaching nearly 2400 km per hour. The similarities with Uranus don't end there. There is also a system of five rings surrounding Neptune, bearing some resemblance to those around Uranus. They extend over a range from 16,000 to 38,000 km from the surface and are composed of thousands of ice particles coated with carbonaceous material, giving them an opaque red color. Although we pass by them, we are unable to see them, and what catches our attention instead is Triton, the largest and mysterious moon with a diameter of 2,705 km, orbiting at a distance of 354,000 km, similar to the moon's distance from Earth. Triton is the seventh moon and the sixteenth largest object in the solar system, slightly larger than the dwarf planets Pluto and Eris. But its true peculiarity is something extraordinarily unique in the solar system for such a large object. It moves in retrograde motion. How is this possible? Well, as usual, hypotheses abound. The most widely accepted one is based on the fact that Triton is similar in size, density, and surface composition to the dwarf planet Pluto. Its retrograde and highly inclined orbit suggests that it originated in the Kuiper Belt and was then captured by Neptune's gravitational force. Triton's surface is icy with mountains, fractures, and craters. Its temperature, below minus 235 degrees Celsius, is the lowest ever measured on a rocky object in the solar system. Triton also has geysers that project gaseous nitrogen to heights of over 8 kilometers. A true world, in short, not to be overlooked as a possible future outpost at the edge of the solar system. Thirteen other moons orbit Neptune, but they are all very small, with diameters that only reach 400 kilometers for Nereid and Proteus, and at the moment we are unable to see any of them. Ahead of us, only the stars a sign for us that the journey has come to an end, and it's time to dive back towards the Sun. In the past, we would have reached Pluto, but as you know, poor Pluto is no longer a planet, at least for now. So we return to Earth, preparing for more adventurous journeys. We accept suggestions for increasingly exotic destinations. <laughs>